Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down USC football as uh, the Trojans prepare for a trip to Stanford and a uh, bad blood rivalry with the Cardinal North taking on South there in California. We got uh, Scott Wolf on the line. You can join him at Inside USC. Joining us for the first time here at Mark Rogers TV, we invite you to like, comment, and subscribe as we bring the best uh, bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry on each and every night. Uh, Scott, how you doing tonight? Doing good, Mark. I'm looking for a USC helmet on your uh, shelf there. I don't see one yet. Okay, well, I'll make an explanation of that. Although Washington made the college football playoff two years ago, we all know that USC had the best team. They won the game in Seattle by two scores and then won the Rose Bowl. But I, I initially made my purchase with the four playoff teams from last year and then uh, picked up two at work uh, just a few weeks ago that were just kind of uh, stragglers out there, Tennessee and Ole Miss. So, yeah, I, I do need to uh, to factor in USC. I, I like they, the ones you have up there. They, they certainly cool factor in prominently. So <laughs> maybe we, we, we <laughs> have to go that route. Well, they, they're one of those programs, obviously, that's relevant, even if they aren't relevant on the field but uh this year remains to be seen and uh, much of that obviously rides on jt daniels and in regards to all off season uh, all the conversation i had concerning usc football surrounded or uh, around this uh, 18 year old kid and um everyone's desire to see him win the job which he certainly did and your your uh, thoughts on his first game performance you know i thought he was fine you know, he made a couple mistakes, but for a true freshman, I thought he did a really good job. Um, I don't think you could expect more than what he did. The problem is he's the most hyped quarterback to ever come into USC. And maybe, I don't know where else, you know, maybe he's the most hyped in the country. Uh, but he's never going to live up to the expectations that people put on him. So he did fine. He did better than Matt Barkley, I think, in his first start, which was a similar situation. But, you know, I think people who think he's going to come in and be better than Sam Darnold or something crazy like that, you know, that's not going to happen. So he's still got a ways to go. And, you know, I don't I don't think he's ever going to be Sam Darnold, but uh, some people probably would disagree with that. Of course, Barkley was the only other true freshman quarterback that started uh, a season opener at USC going back to 2009. And then if I remember correctly, with only one game under his belt, went to Columbus the next week and pulled off a last uh, minute drive against Ohio state to uh, engineer a victory against the Buckeyes uh, in an exciting game in Columbus. We got uh, Scott Wolf on the line from uh, inside USC to talk up the Trojans. So, um, Amon St. Brown, Ross St. Brown, obviously uh, a running mate of uh, JT Daniels at uh, Modern Day, and they hooked up for a touchdown. And another reason to be excited, regardless of the bumps in the road against a UNLV team that uh, was clearly outclassed in the long run, that these two connected, and that might be the future of uh, USC highlights in the passing game. Yeah, you can make the case, you know, the two best players on the team uh, Saturday were both true freshmen from Modern Day. And then you could also make the case, maybe the third best was the kicker, who was five for five, and he went to modern day. So if they didn't have modern day players, I don't know where they'd be at the moment. But uh, definitely, you know, the, the true freshmen, I think, you know, they came through as expected. But football's a game with a lot of guys on the field. And uh, frankly, I saw a team, uh, it looked just like a continuation of last year to me. A lot of sloppy play, inconsistent maybe a little lack of focus, which was a problem last season. So I still see the things they needed to fix last year showing in the first game. And that's why I think it's so important what happens at Stanford. Because if they play like that against Stanford, I think they're going to be in trouble. So the one thing you bring up right there, uh, despite Darnold in play and, our, and uh, Ronald Jones and obviously Deontay Burnett, uh, one of the prolific receivers in the country last year, they bogged down in the red zone more than you would think uh, and, and didn't uh, cash in as much as you thought uh, you would think uh, uh, with that much talent on the field. The offensive line didn't play well against the, the better teams, uh, most notably the, the Notre Dame game on the road, Ohio State in the Cotton Bowl giving up all those sacks. Uh, so the offensive line, they got to make it all happen. Uh, do you have hopes of this unit being better than what we saw last year? I'm hesitant to say that simply because 
they've got a couple of guys that are seniors that played last week when they struggled. They have another senior, Toa Lobendon, who's coming back and playing center for the first time in a couple of years on Saturday. So we'll see what he's at. But, you know, they, they do have quite a few veterans on this offensive line. So I'm not sure at this point how these guys are going to get much better. And then the flip side of that is the defensive line, a lot of people told me was going to be the strength. They gave up 308 yards rushing against UNLV. And some of those were big plays, and they stopped UNLV and a lot of other plays. But 300 yards is still 300 yards in a game rushing. And that, that's against UNLV. So Stanford is obviously going to try to run the ball, too. So for a program that uh, Scott always has the expectations through the roof, and certainly the fan base does, considering, uh, I guess on the plus side, is that it's still the most talented roster in the division. No question, yeah. uh, but it's a weak division. Um, so you might not necessarily have a sterling record, but can still get to a Pac-12 championship game. So what what do you think is the prevailing mindset of the fan base, uh, the, the reasonable fan base for USC football this year? Well, I think, you know, when they look at the schedule, they probably think they, they might lose a few games this season. It would be a natural assumption. I mean, at Stanford and at Texas and back-to-back -back weeks, that's pretty tough. Um, but I think the mindset is kind of like last year. You know, it's USC. They do have the most talent in the Pac-12. I mean, every recruiting class is always the highest ranked in the conference every year. And yet, I don't see anyone, uh, you know, the fans don't feel a lot of confidence because I don't think they bought into Clay Helton. And they still feel like, he hasn't proven himself as a coach. And, you know, I've talked about this a lot. Did he live off of Sam Darnold a lot the last two years with all the victories, you know, at the last second or fourth quarter where it looked like Darnold was just a magician out there. And, you know, what is Helton going to do now? He's still got a highly touted quarterback. But, you know, is it just going to be USC relies on superior talent all the time? and you know, they get out coached. So, you know, this is an ongoing problem with USC football. All right, Scott, we'll settle right there because uh, you hit on the question that uh, I wanted to ask and you started to make your uh, thoughts and feelings known and, and from some of those from the fan base as well. Uh, it was just a turnstile at, at the head coaching spot for a year and a half to two years there with the issues with Sarkeesian and Lane Kiffin obviously not working out uh, for different reasons. And then uh, Clay Helton uh, stabilizes things to a certain extent at the end of that, uh, what, 2015 season. Uh, and then, you know, the, the positives are that the record looks good overall. Um, can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's like 21 and three over his last 24 games, something in that range, obviously with a big, long losing a winning streak to conclude 2016. But when they've matched up again, uh, to bring up the Ohio State and Notre Dame games in particular, those were not uh, pretty affairs. I, I, I don't know that people would be as critical had they lost 24-21 games, uh, but they just didn't look the part in those games, what they're supposed to be. So uh, are, are you looking at the, the Rose Bowl win and Pac-12 championship for the first time in nine years or looking at some of the weaker efforts against better competition as being Clay Helton's uh, signature right now? Well, you know, there's a, I think there's a great stat. I think he's 17 and 0 at the Coliseum, which is a pretty, to me, it's an amazing stat, no matter who they're playing. But, you know, they beat UCLA, their crosstown rival at the Coliseum last year, and the, the gun goes off to end the game, and the fans aren't even cheering or clapping against the most hated team on the schedule. And it was because they were so frustrated that they almost lost the game, and they didn't play clean. and still have, you know, special teams errors and things like that. So, you know, there's, they probably had 40 to 45,000 people at the game last week. So you don't see that energy like when Pete Carroll was coaching, you know, where he energized the fans and people were excited about the team and everything. And, you know, maybe it's hard to compare Elton to Pete Carroll, but USC, this is the, the bar they've set as a program. They want to be Alabama. They want to be what they were 10 years ago. And right now, it just feels like, you know, there's a little bit of a, I described it today as a malaise on the team. 
Like they don't come out and just dominate UNLV, which they should do if they're a good team. So um, I just think a lot of people are skeptical right now about where they're going. And there's no doubt you look at that roster, you know, it's got a lot of talented players and stuff, but everyone wants to know is, is Clay Helton and the coaching staff going to harness it and actually do something with it? Because let's be honest, the Pac-12 is a traditionally weak conference lately. And if you win it, it's great, but you're still not a national player. If you win it, you got to go to the college football playoff and do something if you want to be important. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that uh, USC wins the Pac-12 last year, and it's the USC brand. It's not that Utah jumped up or Colorado and won the Pac-12 and and uh, were taken lightly, but USC, it was Alabama versus Ohio State talk for that fourth spot at the college football playoff, and USC given very little consideration because of uh, the relative uh, perspective on the Pac-12 being weak, and then the conference backed it up in postseason play with only one win in eight outings. Uh, so the Pac-12 uh, needing some desperately some some marquee wins against the nation. They had a chance at that with Washington Auburn and weren't quite able to pull that one off. And obviously we'll have their dates against Notre Dame and USC and uh, Stanford in particular. Uh, we got Scott Wolf on the line from Inside USC. And before we continue, Scott, uh, where can people find you just uh, to find all your information and uh, insight into the uh, Trojans? Well, on Twitter, it's Inside USC, and then I have a USC blog, which is InsideUSC.blog, which is, should be pretty easy to remember, I would think. That's <laughs> but, uh, it's in, just type Inside USC into Google, and usually something will come up. Very nice. So this Stanford rivalry wasn't necessarily something that I was tuned into, um, being a huge college football fan. And it didn't come to mind as this huge rivalry. Now, obviously, Stanford's emerged uh, in the last 10 years, first under Jim Harbaugh as a major player on the national scene. And it's been competitive in the last 10 years. But for me, that was the end of it. It was just simply, well, this became a rivalry because both teams are good and vying for the Pac-12 championship. But as I've I've um, learned from some Stanford uh, people that I, I'm in contact with, there's there's a little bit more to this series than just uh, both teams are good, therefore it's a rivalry. Yeah, I mean, it's really gone back, you know, over 100 years, the rivalry, you know, so it's been a long-standing thing. Now, you know, John McKay hated Stanford in the 60s and 70s, and he hated their fans, and he complained. But more in the modern era, I think it's the whole, you know, Jim Harbaugh, Pete Carroll got it, the rivalry going again, and there was that huge upset when they were underdogs by about 42 points and they beat USC at the Coliseum. And you've had some really good games too. When Andrew Luck was there, they went to overtime at the Coliseum and beat USC. And, you know, even last year, the, the Pac-12 title game, USC was the clear favorite. And Sam Darnold made this uh, miraculous throw from his own end zone on a long pass. And that kind of, you know, kept USC from uh, blowing the game. And they had a goal line stand also against Bryce Love and Stanford on that uh, game. So there, I think there's a, you know, it used to be kind of a genteel rivalry, I would say, in the 80s and 90s. But I, I think uh, it's gotten a little more heated. And, you know, I think it's for both teams, it's a big deal because they, they always sent, they, they end up playing each other the second game of the season because they both play Notre Dame. So the Pac-12 has to make that an early game because of their schedules when they play Notre Dame, either at mid season or at the end of the season. So every year now, I think the fans know they're going to play Stanford the second game of the year, and it might have uh, implications on winning the conference one way or another. So I watched uh, Stanford knock off uh, San Diego state 31 10. It was a close game for two and a half to three quarters going into the fourth quarter and uh, Stanford actually used a formula that you wouldn't expect. They had to go to the passing game uh, to win that game as Bryce Love was ganged up on in San Diego State, clearly sold out on him to try to stop him. And uh, they were effective, but uh, lost the war 31 to 10. Uh, your, your thoughts about Stanford? Don't know if you had much time to prep the Cardinal, but based on previous seasons and if you did see San Diego State and just your feeling about uh, – the odds of USC going up there and pulling off, uh, I won't even call it an upset, uh, but 
uh, most people would consider Stanford to be because of home field advantage, maybe that much better. Well, you know, I saw the, uh, at halftime of that San Diego State Stanford game, I told uh, someone USC is in a really good position to win that game next week. And then the next day I watched USC play and I told the same person, well, on second thought, Stanford's looks like they have a pretty good shot to win that game too. Um, I'm sure USC saw though, the, you know, the way, like you said, they loaded up the box and stopped Bryce Love. But the interesting part to me was Stanford showed that they're a two dimensional team. And they weren't two dimensional when they played uh, the first time last year at the Coliseum. And even in the game at, uh, up at uh, the Bay Area for the Pac 12 title, AJ Costello, he was still kind of a new guy. I mean, he had taken over, but there were questions about what he could do. And he ended up, I thought, played pretty good. But, you know, I think now he's a better quarterback, more experienced. And uh, the thing about USC, last week they faced a one dimensional offense, a team that could run the ball and could not pass. And now they're going to be in the dilemma because they can load up on love, but you've got those receivers, the tall tight ends he can throw to and then if they start getting burned by the pass that's when Bryce Love's gonna get going so they, they pose some problems to uh, USC's defense right now this is Mark Rogers Mark Rogers TV voice of college football we bring on the best bloggers broadcasters and writers in the nation including some analysis from myself of course and uh, we talk uh, USC Stanford uh, maybe the marquee game of the week nationally uh, Scott, we both mentioned the Pac-12 and the rough going last year, and it kind of extended a little bit further back. It hasn't been that long since it was considered arguably the second best conference in the nation. Uh, do you think this is something that's cyclical, or are there real issues with the Pac-12 in regards to recruiting, brand, and so forth? Well, you know, I think it is in some ways cyclical because you had Oregon and USC who were nationally, you know, Two of the best programs in the country and now you've got washington is resurgent again but but i think if you look at it from the conference's perspective they're a little more worried about falling behind financially because their tv deals are not going to bring in the revenue like the sec the big 10 the big 12 they're falling behind uh, in those figures so i think their concern is that going to affect us with the product that we're putting on the field because they're always trying to upgrade facilities because a lot of the schools don't have facilities close to what the SEC or Big Ten schools do. So I think, and then you have the dilemma, which is, I know you know all about this, but the Pac-12 network and who gets to see games on that, who gets to watch the night games at 7.30. I mean, Stanford's had four runner runner-ups in the Heisman Trophy. And is that because they're playing at night and a lot of these Heisman voters are not even watching the game or can't get the game. So those are things that can't be overcome unless you have the best coaches in the country. And right now, you know, they've had a lot of turnover coaching wise, both Arizona schools, Oregon State, um, you know, Cal has a second year coach. So UCLA has a new coach, obviously, which didn't look so hot last weekend, but you know, obviously it's his first game. But so I think they have concerns that maybe we're falling behind here a little bit. And then when you have that one and eight bowl performance, that makes it worse. And then you see Arizona lose to BYU and uh, UCLA lays an egg against Cincinnati. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, is this going to be another bad season for the conference? I mean, it's, it's bad when the, the best win of the opening weekend was a loss to Auburn, a narrow loss. So, you know, it's, they got to silence the critics. And right now they're not doing anything to silence anybody. Yeah, and it's a great point because Washington did have to travel cross country, played a quasi road game, and it was a it was a slug fest. I thought it was the best game of the weekend in regards to two really good teams going toe to toe. It wasn't always pretty, but man, it was a hard hitting physical game and it could have gone either way. It just mm -hmm. happened. Washington lost. They could have won if they played the next week. Who knows? They were that close. Uh, but unfortunately for the Pac-12, uh, their supposed best team, most likely best team, but we shall see, gets tagged with a loss out of conference. Now it appears as though Washington's going to have to run the table and be 
based on your outlook of USC and, and mine and most people as well, they could win the South, but to come through the conference and the out of conference unscathed is unlikely. So looks like all hopes on Washington and they've already lost a game. So they may need to run the table in the uh, PAC 12 for the PAC 12, not to get left out again. Yeah. And now they're in a weird position where uh, the conference has to root for Auburn to win their games because they don't want Auburn to slip down in the SEC because then all of a sudden that loss doesn't look so hot when we're in uh, December and they're trying to pick four teams. So, I mean, I don't think it was a, a death knell or anything that lost to Auburn, but they definitely now need some things. To, they need a little help. And uh, they might get it, but what are, what are we going to do uh, at the end of the year if there's two SEC teams again that are dominant? And uh, you know, are they going to leapfrog the Pac-12? I don't I don't think anyone will be surprised if it happens again. So that's kind of where the problem is. You get into the situation where there's not that expectation, like, oh yeah, we're automatically in the playoff because we won our conference. So uh, you got to earn it, though. I mean, I, I didn't have a problem with uh, Georgia and Alabama going together the final four last year, but um, Pac-12 has to do something to change its perception. As mentioned on the live chat here by our guy, uh, Buckeye State Sports, I was certainly in the camp of Christian McCaffrey winning the Heisman for Stanford in 2015. I thought he was robbed of that trophy to uh, Derrick Henry, who had a great season, but McCaffrey voted for Christian McCaffrey. So I agree with you. I have a Heisman vote, so I, I did vote for him. But I do think it hurt him being on the West Coast or in being at Stanford. Absolutely. At least you're voting for the right guys there. That's good to know. we got Scott Wolf on the line. Uh, you can join him at Inside USC. One other thing for you, you brought up the coaching changes across the Pac-12, and obviously you, CLA is right across town, and Chip Kelly um, is a name. So did that shake up anyone in uh, in Trojan land in regards to that hire, that uh, that could be a threat? Oh, definitely. You know, the, here's the ironic thing. Um, two years ago, people were telling me at SC that Lynn Swan wanted to hire Chip Kelly as the head coach. And that was the guy he was zeroing in on if they were going to replace Clay Helton. So, um I think when uh, they hired Chip Kelly, a lot of people at SC felt like, you know, they kind of pulled one over on SC because now they have the marquee coach and they have the guy that probably excites people and the guy that's going to be popular with the fans and run run a high powered offense and all that stuff that's associated with him. So I think a lot of people were nervous. Now I know a lot of USC fans on social media were gloating. Uh, last weekend because he lost his first game but i mean you can't judge probably this whole year you can't judge him by because he's inherited you know a program that's kind of struggling and it's gonna need some time and uh but, you know the great stat i i saw is he's never lost back-to-back -back games in college as a head coach and uh now he goes to oklahoma so i, I think that stat's gonna fall for uh the first time in his career yeah, most of those fall at, at some point uh, during if you coach long enough. Uh, the the stat that I found interesting is I did a little bit of research during the off season was that, and we know that the recruiting rankings mean a whole lot in volume, but they they can uh, belie what's on the field, the product on the field. But that Chip Kelly in going thirty three in the Pac twelve, thirty three and three in the Pac twelve, uh, and forty six and seven overall at Oregon basically almost ranking by ranking his final roster at Oregon. Those four years had the same recruiting rankings as UCLA has over the last four years. So theoretically he's working with the same level of talent at UCLA as he did at Oregon. Well, yeah, that was the thing I, I talked to SC fans about when he got the job. I said, look, he's gotten more from less. He's used to doing that. Whereas USC has all these highly touted guys and they kind of underachieve. So he doesn't need to have a recruiting class that's the same as USC's to be successful. And he knows, you know, how to go find those three star guys and get them to overachieve and stuff like that. So, you know, my question is he's been gone from the college game for a few years. So 
Does he still have it? And we'll see. And, and there's a lot more high-tempo teams now. He was kind of the only guy, it seemed like, when he first came in at Oregon. And now everybody's doing it, more or less. So I don't know if he can still, you know, pull things on opponents like he used to. But he definitely is a good coach. I mean, I think it was a good hire. But you got to be patient as, uh, you know, he's got to rebuild that program. The morale hasn't been great over there for the last couple of years. So... You know, I, I think back at John Robinson at SC, he, he got blown out his first game uh, and everyone wanted him fired in 1976. And then they ended up winning, I think, every game the rest of that season and went to the Rose Bowl. Now, I'm not predicting that, for obviously, when Kelly's going to go play Oklahoma, but you, you can't judge anybody by the first you know, weekend of the season, obviously. So we got uh, Scott Wolf on the line from uh, Inside USC. And before we let you go, it did make me think of one other question concerning all this this coaching um, situation um, potentially at USC. Clay Helton wins. He'll uh, keep his job. But to what level does he need to win? Well, you have a little bit of a uh, little indication based on what Lynn Swan has had to hire and fire because there's not anything there. Uh, but your thoughts about what would Clay Helton need to do this particular year and going forward to keep his job at SC? Well, a part of it to me is uh, I don't think it's his record necessarily as much as what you're seeing on the field because uh, last year they went to the Cotton Bowl and uh, Lynn Swan was at the game and he talked to a bunch of fa uh, former players, famous guys like Anthony Munoz, Ronnie Lott was there, a bunch of these guys. And he told them, look, it's how you play in the big games that matters. How are you going to do against Ohio State? How are you going to do against Notre Dame? That's the important thing. This is USC. We got to win those games. So I don't care if we're beating Arizona or Arizona State or Oregon State or whatever. So um, if, if they, they win uh, eight or nine games, and everybody's complaining that they're sloppy, underachieving, and they get blown out by, say, Notre Dame or somebody somebody else, Washington, in a Pac-12 title game. People are going to be upset again. So it'll depend on how much Lynn Swan wants to deal with all that. Hey, Scott, uh, first time on Mark Rogers TV. We appreciate uh, your information, the insight. Uh, you've got a great site there at uh, Inside USC, so everybody check it out. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Hey, I had a blast. I've never done this before. It was fun. <laughs> Definitely. Stanford, USC should be a good one. Thanks a lot, Scott. Thanks, Mark. So that was Scott Wolf from Inside USC. We are going to continue talking USC football uh, throughout the hour and maybe take a, a few calls before we uh, shut it down for the night. So we've got uh, Alicia DeArtola. Hopefully coming on the line. I saw Alicia for a quick second, and hopefully she'll be able to join us. Uh, she writes for Reign of Troy uh, to talk up USC football. So let me make sure that uh, she is able to jump on the line. Hi there. Alicia, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm My computer is being a little bit finicky uh -oh. right now. They do that, don't they? Only, only when you have a, 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 an interview schedule. That's the only time. that It works fine until you need it to work and then then that's when it pops up well if we can keep the audio and the video exactly what they are right now i will be satisfied that will be great alicia we have a ton of usc people that watch us that are constantly asking me for usc contributors and your name was brought up a number of times so you come highly recommended oh well that's good i i always like when when people are sort of on board with <laughs> with me that's good to be recommended i'm, I'm flattered Thanks so you'd for having probably me on. Be shocked, Alicia, if the first name I brought up wasn't JT Daniels. So most of us who watched the entirety of college football weren't necessarily watching USC and UNLV, other bigger games on the map. Now we'll watch Stanford, of course, uh, coming up this week, but uh, we see the numbers, maybe some highlights. Uh, your impressions of his first game? I was very impressed. Uh, even, even more impressed when I rewatched the game and just saw what he was doing in the pocket. Cause I'm during games, I'm on the field taking pictures. So you can't really get a feel of how he's actually navigating that pocket as well until you see the, the overhead view. 
really, really impressed with the way that he was getting the ball out quickly, the way he was stepping up, the way he was, you know, throwing the ball downfield. He will need to work out the stuff with the with the chemistry with the receivers, but you can see that inherent quality that we had been seeing at practice, you know, from day one. From day one, you looked at the way he threw the ball and was just sort of floored by it. And so it was no surprise to anyone when he won the job. And the only question from there was going to be, well, how would he handle real action? And you saw on Saturday, handle it like a pro. I mean, he said he was nervous, but I'm not sure it was nerves in that first half. I think it was just those little chemistry issues that they're going to have to come around to. And you could very clearly see him work his way through that game, figure out that, oh, okay, fine, I'm just going to target Amon Ross St. Brown and go with what I'm comfortable with. And and for, for a rookie quarterback, for a freshman quarterback, for him to be able to figure that out, to work himself through it, I think that's so, so encouraging. Yeah, when you don't uh, know exactly what to do, and that's the first time you've had live bullets fired at you, yeah, you go to the guy that you're comfortable with. And they've hooked up a few times, and USC fans are hoping that that's uh, a preview of things to come in the next few years. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's the most exciting thing about JT Daniels winning this job so early is, you know, with with Sam Darnold, it was like when he became the starter as a redshirt freshman, I was like, oh, great. He's going to get three years out of this kid. It's going to be wonderful. And then he left early, and there was like, there was almost that unfinished kind of feeling to the Sam Darnold era. Barring some strange circumstance, USC fans are going to get to see three years out of JT Daniels. And that's, that's super exciting. You can, you can see the sky being the limit with him and hopefully USC can put together, put together a team that rises to that level too. So Alicia, you know, what um, the overall narrative has looked like in recent years, certainly um, the three great playmakers on offense last year with Darnold Jones and Deontay Burnett on the outside, but you know, breakdowns in the red zone, the offensive line wasn't up to playing the elite team, specifically Ohio state in the cotton bowl at Notre Dame. That was an ugly trip. Uh, do you expect the team to be more fortified up front to, to be able to handle some of the bigger games? I think they definitely have better depth. Um, I don't know about the quality, uh, if there's going to be a, a noticeable lift in quality, particularly on the offensive line. I'm taking a little bit more of a pessimistic, trying to realistic view of, of the offensive line because at this point, it's the same offensive line as was there last year, more or less. You lose Nico Fala, but you plug into Alomadon. You're getting about the same deal. Uh, so I think that that USC's offensive line is what it is. What I do like is that Elijah Vera Tucker is a really promising player, able to add some depth there. Clayton Johnson and and, and Austin Jackson being able to switch switch in and out at left tackle or right tackle uh, is is something that will help fortify USC's offensive line. And then on the other side of the, of the ball, the defensive line, obviously so much more depth. Uh, the big question is going to be, can they all stay healthy? And we're already seeing that from USC's offensive line that there are some injury questions. And I think one of the underrated narratives from the 2017 season, not to use it as an excuse, but there were a lot of injury issues that went on on both sides of the line. And those had a huge impact on the trajectory of the season and USC's ability to go up against those big elite um, fronts that you were talking about with Notre Dame and with, with Ohio State. I don't know that USC is going to be ready to face those Ohio State level guys uh, this year, but I do think that that you can expect the depth to give them a little bit more consistency and a little bit less. I think you you've raised this you've raised the floor of both of the lines. I don't know that you've raised the ceiling. I think that would be my big concern. Got a couple uh, excited USC fans in the chat that didn't realize that JT Daniels could stick around for three years or was forced to stick go around for three years, not understanding the age requirements and the time in school. So yeah. uh, that, that that's how it shakes out. Uh, Stanford, this will be a third game against the Cardinal, of course, in the span of a year. Uh, the big win at the Coliseum in which uh, the running game was just in full blast with Ronald Jones leading the way. A hard-fought game. Uh, against the Cardinal at the Pac-12 championship game in which USC was, I think, decidedly the better team, but almost let it slip away. It was a close game in the end. And then uh, now they have to go to Palo Alto as a slight underdog. I wouldn't consider it an upset, but most people, I think, probably 60-40 would consider Stanford uh, to be uh, the team that most likely comes out with a win. Did you get a chance to see Stanford in uh, week one? I was able to sort of half watch most of that game, but I was at a, we had a, a meetup with some of our, our podcast people. So I was sort of watching at the, at the restaurant, but 
um, that was, it was, I'm still trying to grab, get, sort of get my head around Bryce Love only having what, was it 29 or 39, 29 yards? Something? yards. That I, I, cause I wasn't watching closely enough to sort of figure out exactly what it is that San Diego state was doing there. But then you look over and you see JJ Arcega Whiteside lighten things up and you realize that this isn't the Stanford teams, or at least certainly not the Stanford offense that we've been used to over the past few years where they're going to run the ball down your throat. And that's going to be the only thing that they can really do. Um, this team has a really dynamic passing attack that Clay Helton has certainly been talking up uh, in, in practice this week. And that's what you saw against San Diego state. Like, you know, they came through. So uh, your thoughts about uh, Stanford in regards to how, how you feel about this, this matchup uh, specifically uh, these two teams. I am so very torn. Uh, I question their the the defense if the defense is at the level that we've seen the Stanford defenses over the past you know under David Shaw more or less and and going back to John Harbaugh. Um, I, I I'm not certain about the defense, but a few years back I completely wrote off Stan that Stanford lost a bunch of their defensive stars and I completely wrote them off before the start of the season and they came out and just balled out because that's what they do. So. Um, while I'm I'm curious to see how they fill holes on the defensive line, especially Harrison Phillips, but I I also I trust David Shaw what he does enough to have to come in with too much respect there. As far as the matchup goes, you've seen you know over the last uh, how many however many ma matchups that they've had, these two teams are probably going to be more or less evenly evenly set up. And um, for me, this matchup is all about USC. Uh, I, I think, like I said, we, you know what you're going to get from Stanford's defense to a certain degree. Uh, I think you know that you have Bryce Love a, capable of, of breaking off a long play at any moment. You know you have J.J.R. Sega Whiteside and K.J. Costello who have really done a good job. Where I have less certainty is very much on USC side of the ball, uh, on on what will J.T. Daniels do in on, in a road test. What will USC's offensive line do? Can they replicate that September performance from last year? Because if they can, USC is going to run away with this game. I just, I'm not convinced that they can. Um, how will you, USC's defense? How will Iman Marshall handle those jump balls, those 50-50 balls that they throw out, that they throw on field to JJ Arcega Whiteside? Can USC prevent a team from breaking off a 70-yard run at any point this season on defense? Like, I don't know the answers to those questions on USC side of the ball, and that's where I think it's hard to gauge exactly how this one is going to go because like I said I, I I'm more confident in what I know about Stanford than what I know about USC after after week one so the 300 yards rushing by the running rebels seems to be rather alarming uh, considering the opponent the talent gap and all of that uh, Stanford they they had uh, the box loaded up against Bryce Love and that's one of the reasons why that was a smart game plan and it worked for into the fourth quarter before uh, Costello and uh, our Sega white side uh, got loose and, and got things done in the passing game. But um, your just your thoughts against Bryce love and um, having to play that, that game of, uh, you know, how much do we focus versus leaving the outside exposed? And we just gave up 300 yards to UNLV. Yeah. The, the 300 yards against UNLV is a, a big concern because of the way that they happen. It's not a three a 300 yards where they were getting, you know, nine yards a carry or seven yards a carry. It was very much USC was doing a decent job of containing what is, I think they were a top 20 rushing uh, offense last year. So they, these are guys who will put up yards on the ground. It's that you give up that 71 yard fake reverse and you, you can take the, I think it was like a 39 yard punt, the fake punt. You can take that out of the equation because it really wasn't the defense, but they still gave up 30 40, 20 yard rushes in that game. And, the, and it just all, it all started to add up. The concern is that that's exactly what Bryce Love wants to do. Bryce Love, what he did, what he's done in the last two matchups is almost exactly that. He's been more or less bottled up to, insofar as you can bottle up somebody like Bryce Love, but he's always broken off the big run. And that's why he's ended up, I think he had 170 yards in the, in the September matchup and then like 125 on a bum ankle in the, in the Pac-12 championship game. But he had big runs in both of those games. The, the interesting thing about that is that USC still won those games. Uh, they gave up those moments to Bryce Love and still managed to pull out the game. And so I think that when you're going into this game, if you're USC, I almost wonder if you say, well, okay, Bryce Love is going to do what Bryce Love is going to do. 
we can still win a game if Bryce Love breaks off a 70 yard touchdown. So I, I kind of expect Clancy Pendergast to go into this with the same mentality that he would have had going into UNLV and just sort of look at his players and say, you know what, we're not going to stack the box and just say, you know, take Bryce Love out of the game completely because we don't necessarily need to. What Bry- what Clancy Pendergast needs from his defense, uh, talking to him this week, he talked about like eye discipline, you know, if they run a fake or run a reverse or anything like that, recognize it and don't give up that 70 yard uh, backbreaking kind of play. Uh, but that's, I, I, I am banking on Clancy Pendergast going out there and using the same defense that he'll probably use next week against Texas and the week after that and the week after that. I don't think they're going to sell out to stop Bryce Love. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We bring on the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the nation. We've got Alicia De Artola on the line from Reign of Troy, talking up the Trojans and their trip to Palo Alto to take on Stanford. Alicia, you made a comment a few minutes ago about trusting David Shaw. Do you trust Clay Helton? Oh, that's the big question, isn't it? That is the big question. I trust Clay Helton to make USC a nine-win team. Uh, more likely a, you know, a 10 win team. That's what he's done for two seasons. And I think he's done a good job at that. Do I trust Clay Hilton to get USC into the playoff? Eh, not, not totally. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, one, I'm not the kind of person who's out there saying that, you know, Clay Hilton couldn't possibly be the guy for USC. That's, that's not the way that I, that I look at it. I think you have to acknowledge the good things that he's done and he's absolutely had success. It's when you talk about the ceiling, I, I don't trust the ceiling. I, I think he's a good head coach. I don't think he's a great one. Um, if that means not trusting him, I, I guess. But you could also apply that tag to David Shaw as well. David Shaw will have Stanford running at this level he has them running, but has he been able to get over the hump? Uh, not so much with, with Stanford either. So that's sort of where I stand on both of them. Very fair. USC with a 43-21 win over UNLV. JT Daniels' era has begun. It's underway there at the Coliseum. He was so excited about uh, what he was able to do. Knows he has a lot to learn. Uh, Coaches on both sides, from what I read, had glowing things to say about his performance and more so his uh, poise, considering the moment um, and getting that thrown in his lap. uh, Game one right out of the gate, uh, unlike Sam Darnold, who who watched uh, Alabama run over his team and then uh, went into that uh, Utah game and finally got the did he get the start or did he take over in that Utah game on the road? Yeah, he got the start going into That's that right. game. They announced him in the week. Yeah, so then they dropped to one and three, and then he goes on the run to the Rose Bowl win. All right, Alicia, anything we've missed in this uh, little matchup? Uh, I think I think we've covered just about everything. It's going to be a super telling game. I'm excited for it. Uh, it's always a, a big thing to look forward to in September, and I think it's a game that, sort of gets the Pac-12 season off to a fiery start, if nothing else. All right, Alicia, if you can let people know where to find you. Yeah, we're on Twitter at Reign of Troy. You can find me personally on Twitter at Penguin of Troy. Uh, It's reignoftroy.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're everywhere. Um, We have a um, a, a podcast, uh, Patreon, uh, patreon patreon.com slash Reign of Troy for subscribing. We do bonus podcasts and all of that kind of stuff. So we're all over the place. If you're a USC fan, hopefully you see us around. All right. USC fans, I hope you're satisfied. Uh, I tried to do it up as well as I could this week, prepping the big Stanford game. And we love talking USC football. You have to. It's one of the great brands in college football. All right, Alicia, appreciate you stopping by. For sure. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right. uh, Alicia De Artola, Reign of Troy. As uh, we break down college football, of course, we talked to South Carolina and Georgia during the seven o'clock hour took on some Iowa, Iowa State, and then, of course, USC and Stanford late night here, uh, and we'll get this posted on our USC channel as well. Uh, Anything on the live chat, I will check it out and maybe take a call or two before we... Before we call it a night here at Mark Rogers TV, uh, tomorrow at 11.30 Eastern time, we have Steve Merrill on from Pro Sports Information to talk college football betting and look at the lines and the games and the odds for this week. Uh, I enjoyed that conversation each and every week uh, last year during the 2017 season. And Steve and I will get together every Friday. So look out for that live stream. It's at 11.45, 11.45 Eastern time tomorrow. And then, of course, if you miss it live, you can 
see the uh, the recorded version right here at YouTube. So like, comment, and subscribe. If you got friends and family out there, please tell them about us if they love college football. And uh, as we uh, have just begun here, week one's in the books. We've got so much more to talk about, so much more to watch and respond to. I want to thank everyone for joining us for our many uh, series of instant analysis over that weekend one as we went through Thursday night, Friday night, multiple uh, Saturday hits uh, throughout the day from 10 in the morning all the way until like one in the morning as we were on the air all through the day on Saturday and then, of course, Sunday night and Monday night as well and uh, have about fifteen or 16,000 views from those. So we hope to do even much better. That's why we need your help in getting the word out. Like, comment, and subscribe. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 11.45 Eastern time. And then if nothing else on Friday, we will be back at it at 10 a.m. for our kickoff show, 10 a.m. Eastern time before all the games kick off at noon on Saturday with instant analysis throughout the day as only we do it with your help right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football and subscribe to our newsletter as well. The voice of college football, which debuted this past Monday, we'll have another uh, edition coming out this Monday after week two and uh, talk to anybody who's on the live chat or who subscribes to the newsletter, get their take on uh, how well we did in week one and we can do much better and would like to improve with your suggestions. So uh, please join us for that as well. Right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We will see you next time.